Hey everyone, welcome to the Solo Souls Cast. You know me, I'm your venerable host, Shane. Uh, thanks for joining me yet again. Four episodes, just getting off the ground, but don't worry, because we're going to get there. You and me, and you, and you, and all you guys. All three of you. Anyway, uh, I like to try to... I want to try to have these not be so long and wordy and verbose and I've noticed in my last couple episodes I don't even start talking about my topic until almost a good 10 minutes in I don't want that to happen today so and I kind of have a lot to talk about and I'm not pressed for time necessarily because my daughter's asleep and my wife is at work but I get some video games to play y'all I want to finish this in a timely manner and then uh, play my games for a little bit. What are we doing here? This is the Solo Souls cast. If you're here, you like the Souls games and you want to hear me talk about them. That's why you're here. That's why I'm doing this because I love the Souls games. Demon Souls right through Bloodborne and the fairly soon to be released Dark Souls 3 in a couple months. I love all of them. And I love talking about them. And I love, uh, I like thinking about them. I think about them a lot. More than I probably should think about any one particular series of video games. So that's what I'm doing here. Um, the regular Souls cast, which was me and Adam, which we had 14 episodes. You guys may have heard of it. It was awesome. Still on hiatus. And I wanted to keep talking Souls by myself. Better than nothing. So I figured I'm going to do it. I don't know if people have the patience for a single person podcast. Um, I really don't know much about podcasts. I just started listening to them myself about a year ago. And I started listening to a Simpsons podcast called Worst Episode Ever. And a quick side note, a uh, quick plug for them, because if anyone out there loves The Simpsons, please check out the Worst Episode Ever podcast. Uh, just Google Worst Episode Ever. That's enough advertising for them. Obviously, I do this podcast and I did the Souls cast, but I'm not really big into podcasts. I don't listen to, in fact, I listen to two of them, and they're both done by the same people. But all the podcasts that I know of, that I read about, that I hear about, that I see, I'm, I'm pretty sure they have more than one person. So I know this isn't the only podcast with one person, but maybe it's the only Dark Souls podcast with only one person. I don't know. I'll have to look into that, except I'm not going to, because I don't really care that much. Okay, we're getting going. This is already a great intro. Um, I like to talk about what I've been playing. I like to know what Souls players play, um, and I'm not playing a whole lot right now. I mean, I'm playing one game, and I'm playing it a lot, but it's the only thing I'm playing, uh, and that's Infamous Second Son on the PS4. The uh, dude, the two infamous games are some of my favorite games on the PS3. So I beat Final Fantasy VII like a week and a half ago now. And uh, if you're listening to this the day it comes out, I'm recording this probably two weeks before this is going to come out. So by the time you're listening to this, I will have beaten Final Fantasy VII like almost a month ago. But as it, as we are now on uh, February 4th, I beat it about a week and a half ago. It was a lot of fun. Um, got the Platinum Trophy like I wanted to do. It was fun. And it was fun. I'll say that again. And then I decided to play uh, Infamous Second Son. Because I wanted to get the Platinum Trophy. That's the only reason I played it. It's not the reason I bought it. And it's not the reason I wanted to play it originally. But I figured I'll kill two birds with one stone. I'll play a game that I know I'm going to really like. And I'll get the Platinum. And I'm almost done with it. And it's it will it will go down as the easiest platinum I've ever gotten so far. It'll be my twelfth and it's definitely the easiest. It's just play through the game once, collect a bunch of stuff that's really easy to collect, play through the game again, clean up a couple others and you're done. So that's it, that's what I'm playing. Once I finish Second Sun, I really plan on going full bore into Axiom Verge, which I started like at least a month ago and I played for maybe an hour and a half and haven't touched since. It's a really fun retro style um, like Metroidvania sort of game 
you know, a bunch of aliens. I fought two bosses or big giant bosses. You know, really cool. Ah, uh, speaking of bosses, I forgot to plug myself. Uh oh. Bad podcast bad podcasting etiquette. Fuck, already at five and a half minutes. This is what I didn't want to happen. Find me on Instagram, Calamit, K A L A M E E T. Find me on Twitter. I'm also Calamit, but replace that L with a one. And um, YouTube. Speaking of acting and verge boss battles, uh, you can find me on YouTube. Just search Shane Norton. Picture of a beer bottle. That's my profile picture. I have uh, like 161 videos. You can find the episodes of the Solo Souls cast there, plus my boss battle videos. So do all that stuff, okay? Just do it. Don't even think about it. You've been conditioned all these years to be a mindless sheep, and you just do whatever the internet and people on the internet tell you to. So just go to those things and look at them. I've been talking for almost six and a half full minutes, and I have not even said what this episode is going to be about. But if you're here, you've probably read the description. You've probably seen the title. You probably know I'm talking about Dark Souls 2 DLC. <sighs> DLC is a bit of a touchy subject for some people, and that's a whole other, other discussion. I'll quickly say I generally don't care for DLC. The two big exceptions are Borderlands. Um, all the Borderlands DLC, at least for the first two games, I haven't played the pre-sequel yet, unfortunately. My wife and I will get to it one day. All the DLC for Borderlands 1 and 2 are incredible. Very, very fun. They add countless hours to the game, countless in, countless fun. That doesn't really make sense, but they took Gearbox took time and care. Um, they didn't just slap together some crappy map pack or give you de armor for your horse. Um, it's legit DLC and it's a lot of fun. And of course, my other um, exception to the DLC rule is the Souls games because I can never get enough Souls. And that's, um, dark, you know, Demon Souls didn't have DLC. People speculated and people thought, maybe rightly so, who knows, that the broken Archstone in the Nexus, there's, I think, six Archstones and five of them are worlds that you can go to and, you know, play through the game and there's a broken one. And people had thought that that was going to be an entryway for DLC. Never happened. Um, Dark Souls obviously had DLC. Um, Artorias of the Abyss, it was called. It was incredibly amazing. Um, you can find our normal Souls cast episode about that. Uh, Adam and I did one. It was episode. I was just looking at the episode list today. It was episode 11 or 12 or 13. You can go to bluegamer.net um, and find the podcast through there. Uh, that's Adam's video game website. Great website. Um, or you can go to his YouTube page as well, which is Blue Gamer. Um, <clears throat> and he has all the Souls cast posted up there. So if you want to hear us, he, him and I talk about that DLC, get your ass over there once you finish listening to this one. Because you're going to want to hear what I have to say. Trust me. And then Dark Souls 2 comes out. And it's basically an inevitability at this point that it's going to have DLC. And Bloodborne came out and had DLC. And I'm going to assume Dark Souls 3... When all is said and done, we'll also have DLC. And I think that is perfectly fine. I have absolutely no problem with that whatsoever. So I'm talking about the Dark Souls 2 DLC here. Uh, I feel like I'm, I might even need to split this into two episodes because I only want this to be 30 or 40 minutes at the most. I'm already at 9 minutes and 15 seconds, and there's three different DLCs. So we'll see what we can get done here. Maybe I'll do a part one and a part two. <sighs> Although I really don't want to do that. Um... Dark Souls 2 did their DLC a little bit differently. Um, they released episodic content. They announced a few months before the DLC came out that they were going to do three separate episodes. And it was this trilogy of episodes that was called the... the um, what was exactly the name of it? The, uh, the Lost Crowns trilogy. And each DLC had like a name. And it had a... Each one had a self-contained story that tied into the main game, but also was on its own. But in the end, they did add to a larger picture. It's it's a little confusing. So they released the first one, which I believe came out in Ju June, July. Sorry, the first one came out in July. I'm looking at the Dark Souls 2 wiki here. Um, it's called The Crown of the Sunken King. Then they released the second one a month later in August. It's called Crown of the Old Iron King. And then they released the third and final one at the very end of September, 
or in the very beginning of October. They release it for Xbox and PS3 on different days for some reason. Um, and that's called The Crown of the Ivory King. And first hearing about this, I was obviously very excited. They released um, like a teaser trailer for the whole thing and it looked really cool. They showed the different locales and you saw some snowy areas and lava filled areas. Um, so it was really exciting before they even came out. Having to pay $10 a piece for them and essentially spending $30 to buy these sucks a little bit. Um, this was back when it was on PS3. Now, if you don't have any of them or you don't have the game, you can just buy the PS4 um, uh, Dark Souls 2 Scholar of the First Sin, which has all three of the DLCs plus a couple added things. I think there's one added boss and a couple new other things, which I have been playing through. I haven't played in a while, but I was playing through it as of a couple months ago. So, when they first came out, and these were, let me check the dates again real quick. Now, of course, I don't get a year. But when these came out in 2014, maybe, you know, I was very excited. And I bought them as they came out, so, you know. They, the the Sunken King one came out, you bought it, and then you had about a month to beat it and finish it before the Old Iron King one came out. And that's what I did. I bought one, played through it a bunch, and then bought the next one, played through it a bunch, you know. I will say, by the end of it, I did, I was experiencing a bit of Souls fatigue, which is something that doesn't happen often, but it can happen, and it sucks. But, the, uh, I'm just going to kind of go over each individual DLC because they have a lot of similarities and then um, I'm just going to talk about them that way so overall each one the main story is you're going through a new area with new enemies new bosses new weapons new spells new armor all that to find a lost crown if you recover all three of these crowns you get uh, I don't remember exactly if it's a special item but it also ties into the lore so that's basically what you're doing um, you get some new dialogue from Vendrick, I believe. So it's some pretty neat stuff. Um, and like I said, my initial thoughts when they first were announced and when they first came out, I really liked them. I was really excited and I really liked them. Um, so I'm going to kind of go through them now a little bit. Crown of the Sunken King was the first one. And maybe my favorite one, I'm not sure. It had, um... I'm going to talk about the look of it and the feel, and then I'm going to talk about the difficulty, and then give a quick rundown of the bosses. And I'm just going to kind of do that. I'm going to do that for all three of them. So the, the, the look of Sunken King, you go into a underground city. It's a gigantic, expansive underground cavern with a city and some big temples, and it looks amazing. It really looks great. It's one of the best-looking areas in the DLC and in the main game. So right off the bat, they knock it out of the park with this. Um, you walk, you go through a door that starts the DLC, and I believe this is the one where you start in a like um, a hallway that's crooked because it like crumbles and has fallen apart. And stepping foot into the new area is great because you're really really high up, and then you can see downward. You can see the the temp the temple and like this kind of city. So you're kind of making your way down to the very bottom of it. So the verticality is great. And then um, you see a dragon almost immediately. He's sleeping and then you go near him and he, he's kind of up above you and when I first saw him I didn't even know it was a dragon. I thought it was just a piece of the background like just like a rocky outcropping. But he wakes up and flies down and flies over a bridge and you don't see him again for a little while. But rest assured you know you're probably going to be fighting them. And that's what I thought, too. So, make your way through this DLC. Um, each DLC kind of has, like, a new little mechanic, which was a cool idea. Um, this one, they kind of have, like, these almost puzzle trap sort of things. They're, they're pillars that you can hit or shoot with an arrow that when you shoot them, they spin and they move a piece of geography up or down or it exposes new areas so you can kind of play with that 
so you can have a platform that you can raise up to access a new area or you can use it to kill enemies um, I mean this is all old news I'm sure anyone listening to this has probably played it but it was it's really cool it was different for a Souls game and I really like that um, so um, I I really like that conceit that they kind of made it they purposely went out of their way to make it different and then um, so you go through this area you fight some new enemies although the new enemies are basically just undead soldiers when you get towards the end you're in an underground lake which looks really cool there's lots of um, stalagmites sticking up from the ground and there's these really weird dinosaur monsters that are like that are just like they're almost like the gigantic monsters from uh, Lost Isleth from the original Dark Souls but those like legs basically these are much much smaller but they're, they have huge mouths and really weird teeth they're really cool um, I wish I knew what their names were. Whatever, you go through, you get to the bottom, you have to, there's a, a part towards the end of the DLC where you have to climb down a series of, um, it almost like a crumbling tower kind of thing. You have to climb down it and you have to like fall in the correct spot. Make sure you don't fall too far and die and all that. And that's when you get to the first boss who's named Alana the Squalid Queen. And boy is she squalid. I don't know the story exactly. Um, she bears a resemblance to Nishandra, who is the final boss of the main game. I believe she's her sister, and she's also a piece of Manus, who Nishandra is like a piece of Manus that came apart. Um, so that's why they have similarities, and it's a tough battle. It's a very tough battle, I thought. Um, it's mainly a tough battle because she can summon a few enemies to help her. She can summon skeletons. She can summon the little pigs that you found in the um at the beginning of the game that I can't even think of the area now. The hub world. What the hell is it called? Well, I can't think of it, so hey, enjoy this Dark Souls podcast where the host can't even think of the most basic element of the game. But apparently she can summon those pigs and she can summon Velstat. Not really Velstad, I don't think, but a copy of them. And that makes the battle, for me at least, impossible. I cannot kill her with Velstad also running around swinging his giant hammer. Um, it, it makes it very, very hectic. Because she's shooting missiles and these like bomb things that explode after a few seconds, and she hits pretty hard herself. So, on my initial playthrough, I find her very, very hard. Once you beat her, you go through a little tunnel and you immediately find the next boss, who's actually the final boss of the DLC, the main, the mandatory boss, and it's the dragon that you saw earlier. His name is Sin, uh, Sin the Slumbering Dragon, and he's got a big spear sticking out of him, and there's some really cool lore behind him, uh, poisoning the entire city and things like that. It's very cool. So you have to fight him, and he's even harder than Alana. Uh, that battle's a son of a bitch, let me tell you. And then there's a final boss. It's an optional boss. Um, all three of the DLCs have an optional area with an optional boss. This one is the... Um, let me take a quick look. The Cave of the Dead, I believe. Yeah. The Cave of the Dead. <clears throat> and these optional areas in the DLCs, I guess, were meant to be like co-op areas where you either summon an NPC or summon a friend or well someone to help you because they're very very difficult even you know for this game standards they're very very difficult and they're purposely made like that I guess they the developers wanted you to summon people to go through <clears throat> they're kinda half baked and they're not very much fun and of course I usually went through them solo so that was even worse but the cave of the dead bosses there's three of them and they're called the uh, the Grave Robber. Oh, let me click on them because they have like weird names. Oh, just Grave Robber. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> the Afflicted Grave Robber, Ancient Soldier Varg, and Sarah the Old Explorer. And they they're all just NPCs, but they all wear the armor of 
other Souls characters. Uh, like Varg is in Havel's armor. So you're basically just fighting Havel the Rock. But you're also going to fight two other people. Um, the Grave Robber wears Alva's armor. And Sarah, the old explorer, wears Lucatil's mask. Um, and kind of her, I think her armor as well. So you're going to fight Havel on top of these other two. And it's really just such a huge pain in the ass. It's not fun at all. Very, very unfun, actually. And ironically, this is something I want to get to a little later, but I'll uh, give a little tease. Ironically, it's the only boss battle out of all nine out of across these three DLCs that I beat solo. Stay tuned for the story. So that's my quick overview of Crown of the Sunken King. I loved it. I thought it was great. It was really fun. The the trap puzzle element they added was great. Um, the look of it was amazing. It was almost breathtaking. And then the bosses, while they were very, very difficult, they were great. They were much better than most of the bosses in the main game. There were monsters. Well, not the, not the Cave of the Dead bosses. But Alana was a monster, even though she was pretty humanoid. But the, Sin, the Slumbering Dragon, that's great. Uh, I'm wearing a lot of dragons in Dark Souls, too. Besides that whole area that was full of dragons. Uh, so after that one, in August, they released the next one, which was Crown of the Old Iron King, which this one does directly correlate back to the main game, because, you know, Old Iron King. And this takes place in um, an area called Broom Tower. B-R-U-M-E, not B-R-O-O-M. That would be a little bit silly. And it's a giant tower that kind of looks like the um, Iron Keep. It's got lava. Um, but it's, it's, it's pretty different. It looks awesome, though. Again, it looks really cool. It looks like... Playing through it, when I originally did, I actually had feelings of Demon Souls. It reminded me of Demon Souls very, very strongly. And there were certain parts that reminded me of the Tower of Latria, which was the prison-like area of uh, Demon Souls. And, I don't know, just playing through it, I thought, like, man, I'm really feeling Demon Souls here. And, in fact, I would say nothing has ever made me feel so nostalgic for Demon's Souls than the very first time I played through some of those areas of the old Iron King DLC. So that was pretty cool. But the DLC itself, you know, it looks really cool. You start off in, again, you go through a big door, and then you're outside, and there's a gigantic chain, a chain big enough that you can walk on, that extends from where you are out into the distance to a huge tower that you can see. So you got to run across this chain, and then the tower is where the whole DLC takes place. Um, yeah, so the Broom Tower is where the um, majority of the DLC takes place. There's also an optional area called the Iron Passage that has an optional boss, which is super lame. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so I think when it first came out, I liked this DLC more than the first one. Again, it had that... I had that Demon's Souls feeling, and the the new little conceit with this one was there were um, these idols that were placed throughout the whole map, and they would buff the enemies, any enemy that was near it. They would either they would either um, give them extra strength, they would heal them, they would um, some of them were even offensive and would just do spells on you. But there were these there were these like what the hell that is called they're like statues and you could only you could destroy them but you needed a special item that you found throughout the throughout the DLC so that was kind of the new thing they added like the like the puzzle element in the first one this one you had to get rid of these idols that's what they were get rid of these idols with something called smelter wedges um and that really that was cool too because you had to 
you know, make sure you found all the wedges so you could destroy all these things, and you had to make sure you, it, it made you be very thorough in exploring the DLC. Um, and it really played into the very end where you had to fight the final boss who um, was surrounded by three or four of the idols that would heal him. And I'll, I'll get to him in a little bit because I got a lot to say on him. Even though, I don't know how much I will say that we're 26, almost 27 minutes in. Um, shoot, what was I going to say? Yeah, so that was like the new thing they added. Again, I, I thought it was really cool. It was, it was different for a Souls game. I liked the direction they were going. It seemed like they wanted to not just add new content like bosses and monsters and weapons, but they wanted to add new things to the world, new new ways to play the game. And I was uh, I was appreciative of that. They weren't like huge game changing things, but it's better than nothing. And I I liked it. I think it was uh, I I thought it was effective. Um, I found the old Iron King DLC to be probably harder than the Sunken King DLC. Um, mainly because of the bosses. There, there were certain areas in the DLC that I remember... Well, I remember reading reviews because I love reading reviews. I don't know why, I just I always have. I like knowing what other people think about certain things. So I read the review of the DLC, probably the morning it came out, and they had likened part of it to the Batman Arkham games, where you could survey a whole room and then figure out your exact plan of action, like, I'm going to take these two enemies out and then I'm going to do this and that, which is something you routinely did in the Arkham games. And they had used that parallel for this DLC because there's certain areas that you can get a drop on the enemy I mean dropping right in would be death but you were above the enemy and it's like there's let's say a big room and then there's a hole in the ceiling and you're above that room looking down into the hole so you can kind of see where the enemies are figure out your plan and there's a couple little areas like that so that was kind of neat um but it still proved to be pretty difficult there were some really big enemies that just were nasty <coughs> Uh, I'm going to talk about the bosses now for a minute. Uh, strictly story, there's only one boss. Um, and that's the Fume Knight. He is a big knight, so we're not really off of the whole knight boss thing yet. But he looks really, really cool. He's a big, like, greenish knight. Green armor, he has a helmet, you can't see his face. He has two swords. He has a big giant sword and he has a littler sword. Um... He's at the very end of the DLC. You have to fight him. He is very hard. Unbelievably hard. Um, when I first played it on the PS3, when I had bought it, I tried him... I don't remember how many times. Um, my blog that I used to run, which I am going to get back to doing soon, I haven't had a chance yet because I haven't had time and I've been lazy. But my blog I used to run, I used to highlight the boss battles. See, boss battles, YouTube page, my blog, I love bosses. And I highlighted that battle, and I talked about it, and I counted the amount of times I died, and I'm pretty sure it was in the 40s. So, that, that's not an exaggeration, because I kept a tally. Every time I died, I would make a, a, a tally mark. Um, so he really gave me a big hassle. When you get about halfway through the battle, when you... um take off, I think when you take off about half of his health, he puts away his little sword and just takes his big sword and he buffs it so it's like on fire and it's, he, he gains a couple new moves and the sword just gets bigger and I played it so many times that I got his first form down pat where I could get through his first, the first part of the battle I think without even getting hit and then once he buffed that sword I would die within 10 seconds. It was like a mental block where as soon as I saw the sword buff and get really big, I just my brain just shut off and I couldn't do it. And there's some interesting interesting lore behind this boss as well. Um, spoiler alert, I guess, for DLC to a game that came out two years ago. Um, it's Velstad's brother. Uh, 
I forgot what his name is actually. Shoot. But it's his brother at any rate. And I guess if you go into the battle wearing, I think, at least Velsat's mask, he buffs his sword immediately. That's like his rage mode. So that, that's an interesting little detail. So if you beat that boss, then you beat the DLC. There's still two other bosses. There's the optional boss at the end of the Iron Passage, who is a very lazy reskin of the Smelter Demon from the main game. One of the, the tougher bosses in the main game. He's blue this time, instead of red and fiery, and I think he's magic based instead of fire based. And he looks a little bit different, his horns are different, I think the original Smoker Demon has a... His horns like turned one way and this guy has them turned the other, but it's the exact same battle. He has the exact same moves, he does the exact same things. He might have one additional area of effect attack, but that's it. Um, and again... This is at the end of the Iron Passage, which is a really arduous, really annoying area full of a ridiculous amount of enemies. They're supposed to do it co-op, but even co-op I had a really hard time getting through it. So that boss sucked. Really disappointed. I mean, he's optional, so it's not a huge deal, but really disappointed that they just slapped blue skin on the Smelter Demon. And finally, maybe the best boss of the DLC a really really cool boss anyway is Sir Alon. I think that's how you pronounce it. A L O N N E Alon. Um you might that name might sound familiar. If you have played and gone through the Iron Keep, the knights you kill, you get their armor, they're Alon knights. Um these are the knights that they're I believe these knights in the Iron Keep are named after Sir Alon. And he is like um you actually have to go into the memory of the old Iron King. Remember going into memories? Yep, they use it in the DLC, which I actually like as well. I think that's kind of cool. They didn't totally forget about that. So you have to go into his memory, fight through a really irritating area full of those Alon enemies, those Alon knights and captains and whatnot, to get to probably the hardest boss, I think. Sorry, let me stop and rephrase. The boss that I died to more than any other Souls boss in any Souls game, I'm pretty sure. Again, when I kept track of my blog, I counted the amount of times I died, and I died to him in the 60s, I believe. Um, and again, that's not an exaggeration. So, he really, really kicked my ass. And again, he's, he's a knight, he's humanoid. He has a really long samurai sword, and he has like a kind of a samurai garb, and he's just very fast. He moves real, he moves fast, but he has a very fluid motion to him, where he can glide across the room and slice his sword up, and you need split second timing to dodge it. And he has some other attacks, but he's mainly just sword based. Um, kind of reminds me of False King Alant from Demon Souls, the way he glides across the floor. So, very very difficult battle, but it's cool. If you can kill him without getting hit, he will kill himself. Uh, Harikiri it's called, or Seppuku or something like that, where he takes a sword and sticks it into his stomach. Um, I have not done it myself, and I'm not going to bother trying, because that takes way too much patience. And that's not not for me. Um, so that's that's kind of, those are my thoughts on the, the Sunken King. Another great DLC. Now, the crown of the Burnt Ivory King is the final one. They released this September 30th for the Xbox and PC, and then October 1st for the PS3. So the, the day after, for some reason. And this takes place in a big snowy area. And again, the snow, it looks awesome. Um, you know, it reminds me of the, the painted world of Ariamis from Dark Souls which was before this the only snowing area in any Souls game. Of course now we have Bloodborne with Kanehurst Castle which also had snow. Um, but the um, the sunk, sorry, the Burnt Ivory King DLC, the, the, the snow looks great. Um, and it, the area is called Frozen Elium Lois which is quite a strange name. But stuff in this DLC ties back to actually stuff from Dark Souls, which is also really cool, but 
the look, like I said, it's snowy. It's not just snowy. It's not just white snow on the, on the ground. It's like a giant blizzard that's always going. And there's parts where you, the wind will blow so hard you can barely even see your character. So you gotta like stop for a minute. Um, and you can't really see the enemies. And so that's kind of their conceit for this one. That and there's lots of areas that are covered in ice that you can't break. That you have to find, um, you have to do something in the DLC for someone. And then they'll unfreeze the ice. And then you have to go back and search all these, they're essentially new areas. So they kind of made the DLC twice as big by just blocking off certain areas that you can't go to yet. So you go through the whole you go through the, the whole map and then you have to backtrack and go to these other different areas. Which I'm making it sound kind of crappy, but it's still cool to you have to really discover and you have to really remember where the blocked off areas were. But I like the look of this one a lot. Um, overall, I'm pretty sure it's my least favorite of the three. Um, I'll get into that. Uh, you know, let me look into it right now because, like I said, I was I was experiencing Souls fatigue at this point because I had bought. When did these come out? Did they come out the same year? They must have. I bought Dark Souls 2 and played through it and got the platinum trophy, which took like two solid months of playing it, and then I put it down for a couple months, and then the DLC came out, so I, then I picked it back up and played it and put it down and picked it up and played it, put it down, and then I was just kind of getting sick of playing. And this final DLC was such a huge pain in the ass anyway. Yeah, so I was like just not... I don't know, I was just getting a little tired of playing the games at this point. But, um... The difficulty, I'll say on this one, is... It's about on par with the other ones. Um... Maybe as hard or harder, actually. Each one gets maybe a little bit harder than the one before it, uh, specifically for a couple different reasons. Uh, this DLC has three bosses, just like the other ones, two regular ones and then an optional one. Um, I'll get to the optional one in a minute, because I actually didn't even beat them. I actually didn't even make it to them. But this DLC, you have to go through, um, you have to find, it's kind of cool too. The first boss you find, um, you can fight it immediately off the bat. But if you do that, if you go right to it, it's invisible and you can't see it. Which um, I'm sure people have probably beaten it when it's invisible. Maybe I don't even know if that's possible. But people are people who play Souls are crazy, so I'm sure someone's done it out there. Um, but you have to if you find a certain item that allows you to see this boss. So you need to go through, find this item, you go beat the boss. Who is a giant tiger, which is really cool because that's that's pretty different for the Souls games. And then um, you continue through the DLC. When you get to the end of the DLC, after you beat the, that boss, who's um called? I'll tell you in one second because I am blanking. Ava, the King's Pet. That's A A V A. So kind of a cool name. Um, once you beat him, you go through. You get to the end. And you can jump into a big hole, which you fall for a while, and that leads you to an area called the Old Chaos. And this area looks very, very, very similar to some areas in Dark Souls. And the fact that it's called Old Chaos, I think, is a direct callback to the Bed of Chaos. Because you fall down, and it's like a big circular arena surrounded on all sides by lava and then if you tilt the camera up to look up all you see is like giant branches and vines and it looks very much like the bed of chaos so i'm pretty sure the two are related somehow which is which i really think is cool it's one of the coolest looking boss rooms in any of the souls games so it's got that going for it um i'm getting a little ahead of myself though you know what screw it let's get into the bosses let's just go right into it the first one, Ava, is pretty hard. It's a big giant white tiger and it has like ice magic, I guess. Well, not really ice magic because ice magic doesn't exist in Souls games, but like Soul Spear kind of magic. But it looks icy. And it jumps around and it can swipe its paws and it can swipe the paws very, very quickly. Um, almost without notice and it's really hard to get the timing down. 
so that was a very hard boss for me um, once you get past that boss you can go to at some point you can go to a optional area uh, called the frozen outskirts which is just like the cave of the dead and the iron passage I did not make it through the frozen outskirts I tried for a little bit and it's one big giant area that is basically whiteout condition blizzard and you can barely see and you have to make your way through it looking at landmarks that are like far off in the distance but you also have to worry about these like enemies that are on horses that you can't see until they're right up to you and they're so hard to kill and it's just this it's probably the worst area in any Souls game I, I couldn't get through it and I didn't want to bother especially once I learned what the boss was the boss is it's two bosses Lud and Zalin and they are the king's pets yes it is two more tigers but they're black they're not white so it's totally different and you have to fight two of them at the same time so I said no I'm not even gonna bother uh, so I'd never got through the frozen outskirts I never fought Lud and Zalin and I, I'm okay with that I really w generally try to beat every boss in every especially every souls game I play but I was not gonna fight these fucking clowns huh <sighs> And that leaves the Burnt Ivory King himself, who resides in the Old Chaos. And this is quite a battle. First, you need to recruit knights, Elium Lois knights, who are found throughout the DLC. You have to, they're behind doors, you open the doors and then they join you. Um, you can recruit, you can recruit, technically I don't think you have to recruit any of them. You can recruit up to four to help you. So you get anywhere between two, three, four of these knights. You go to the area where you jump down the big hole. You jump down the hole, the knights follow you, and you're in this big arena, and there's three gigantic, like, portals, and burned knights come out of them, and you're just going to fight these knights, and there's a bunch of them. So it's like a, hu it's like a huge war. It's you and four of your knights, and then if you summoned anybody against all these other NPC knights. So, you know, it's like 10, 12 people fighting each other, so it's really cool in that aspect. But as you go and fight and kill these knights, your knights will sacrifice themselves to like freeze up the portal so the knights stop coming. Because if you kill one knight, another will come through the portal. So eventually, these your knights, the Elium Lois knights, freeze these portals so you're free to you don't have to worry about those those charred knights. Once all three of the portals are frozen, you'll either be by yourself if you have three knights or you'll have an extra knight to fight the burnt ivory king he comes up from a final portal that like it comes up from the ground this is big production and then he steps out of it and he is another humanoid knight you know what else is new but he still looks pretty cool and he's pretty similar to some of the other he's pretty similar to some of the other sword wielding bosses from the dlc he moves pretty he has nice fluidity to his movements. He's pretty graceful, I guess you could say. He swings his sword around. Um, I don't remember a lot of the fight, and I'll explain that in a minute. But again, he's another really hard boss. Um, once you beat him, you get the final crown, and then you're all done with the DLC, and you're, you know, that's it. Alright, I'm at 45 minutes. I'm going to try to wrap this up in like the next 10. Um... Yeah, so he's the final boss. He's hard. All the bosses are hard. They put some of the hardest bosses I think they've ever made into these DLCs. I want to talk about how I beat all the bosses. I teased it before. I beat all of the bosses minus the Cave of the Dead bosses and minus the Lud and Zalin bosses because I never even fought them. I beat them all originally with summons. Alana, Sin, Fume Knight, Sir Alon, Blue Smelter Demon, Ava, and the Burn Ivory King. All I had to summon people. And that was something that really bothered me when I played through originally on the PS3. I was like, man, I can't beat any of these bosses. I suck. They are hard, but they're beatable, as you'll soon learn, because the story has a happy ending. So... 
I didn't beat any of the bosses on my own besides those cave bosses. Um, and how I beat the Burnt Ivory King was especially interesting. I had summoned one or two people and I had a knight with me. So it was either me and two like actual humans that I summoned and a knight or me and a knight and a human. So it was like three or four people against the Burnt Ivory King. And I don't know, about 20 or 30 seconds into the battle, the Ivory King froze. He like just stood in place and did not move at all. Um, and that allowed us to just wail on him. We just stood there just attacking him. He didn't move. He didn't do anything. And when he had like less than a quarter of his health, he finally started moving again. But by then, you know, he took like five more hits and he was dead. I have no idea what happened. I've never ever seen a Dark Souls or a, a Souls boss glitch out and just freeze and not move like that. I've never seen it happen in Dark Souls 2. I've never seen it happen anywhere. Um, one of the bosses in Bloodborne in the Chalice Dungeons can glitch, but it doesn't even glitch like that. So I don't know, it was very weird. But I took it because the boss was giving me such a headache and I was just so sick of playing the game that I said, I don't care. This is the lamest way I could possibly beat this boss. I don't care. So, on top of having to summon, the game basically beat the boss for me. But, when I got my PS4, I bought Scholar of the First Sin, and I started playing through it. Um, I still had a lot of fun with it, and I decided, you know, I'm going to go through the DLCs, and I'm going to beat all these bosses on my own. And, you guys, you'll be happy to know, I know you'll be happy to know, that I have. Almost. I beat Alana and Sin. I didn't bother with I didn't bother with any of the optional bosses, so they can go to hell. I beat the Fume Knight and Sarlon, and I beat Ava all by myself. Totally solo, and I'm really happy about that. The only boss I have left is the Burnt Ivory King. And I just haven't played it recently because I just I hate that battle. It's cool how it's like a big giant war and it's if ever the term epic could be used for something, because I hate the way people throw that word around. You could use it for that battle. But at the same time, it's so drawn out and it's so tedious because if you die, you don't have you don't just start at the burn every king. No, no, no. You have to fight all the fucking knights again. So if you do that battle 10, 15 times in a row, you're gonna be there for a while. And that was another part of the problem. I would either die to the knights or I would just be so exhausted from fighting the knights that I would die to the burn every king like immediately. So like, I can never just get a good one-on-one -on -one fight with him. Because you have to wait through all the other bullshit first. So, I'm really happy that I was able to beat all those bosses my own second time through. All those boss battles are available on my YouTube, by the way. Um, and there's some pretty good ones, too. I think they're uh, they're pretty good. And they took me a long time. Uh, Fume Knight, Suralon, and Sin the Slumbering Dragon especially took a very, very long time. But I got them, and I'm really happy about it. So, I think that might just about be it. I don't know if 50 minutes is quite enough time to give to this large amount of content. And I know I probably glossed over a lot of things. I picked specific points to talk about each of these DLCs. Like, like the look and the feel. I kind of talked about the difficulty and I talked about the bosses. And I talked about how each one is different. Like, compared to like the normal game, like the puzzle element and the um like the snow element and then having to recruit the knights for the other one. So I, I, I wanted to go through. You know, I could probably talk another hour on all these DLCs. Um the final thing I will say before I, I'm done here playing through them a second time as I have in the, the Scholar of the First Sin isn't as fun as the first one. As, as, as the first time I played through them, I don't look at them really as fondly as I look at, say, the Dark Souls uh, Artorias of the Abyss DLC, or even as fondly as I look at the Old Hunter's Bloodborne DLC. Um, and they're great DLCs. If you haven't played any of the Dark Souls 2 DLCs, I strongly urge picking up the Scholar of the First Sin um, edition. It's totally worth it. But they're good and they're worth playing through they, just, they don't resonate quite as well as the Dark Souls DLC which on the whole I guess 
is what Dark Souls 2 is anyway. It's an amazing game that doesn't quite resonate like its predecessor. And that might sound like a total flip-flop from what I've been um, on record as saying in a couple of our Adam and I's normal Souls cast where I said Dark Souls 2 was my favorite game in the series. I'm pretty sure the very first episode I said Dark Souls 2 was my favorite game in the series. Um, that's not my opinion anymore. Because I also preface it by saying this could change on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe on like an hour-to-hour -hour basis. Dark Souls is my favorite. And I don't know where the other three rank. I don't know where Bloodborne, Dark Souls 2, and Demon Souls rank. But Dark Souls 2 is not my favorite. One day, it could be my favorite again. And I have no problem with it being other people's favorites. Um, but that's how I feel about it right now. The DLC is great and it's fun. There's lots of good things about it. It just, it's not, it's not Artorias of the Abyss. And you really can't dock your points for that because nothing is Artorias of the Abyss. And nothing is the original Dark Souls. So, that's what I'm going to say about it. I'm going to end this now because I'm at 53 goddamn minutes. I really wanted this to be like 40. But you know what, that's fine. This is some good content here. Um, as I said at the top, this is being recorded probably two weeks before it gets released. Um, I'm going to stop recording everything so far in advance because then it's hard to like keep them current. Like today, like I said, February 4th today is. Um, either today or yesterday, some six minutes of Dark Souls 3, um, like a live stream was leaked that I watched a little bit of that I thought about maybe I would talk about here. But if I talked about it at the end of this episode, by the time it's released, that will have been, you know, two week old news and more different Dark Souls 3 news could have potentially come out. So I'm not gonna talk about that. I will say, um it did look awesome and I'm very excited for Dark Souls 3. But I'm gonna start recording these not two weeks in advance. So I like to record them Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday of a week and then have that released the following Tuesday. I still haven't set down a definite day to release them yet. That, that's how I want to do it. So um, I think that's everything I wanted to say. Thank you everyone for joining me on uh, episode 4 of the Solo Souls cast, uh, Dark Souls 2 DLC. It's been a lot of fun basically out of breath now um so i'm gonna play infamous second son i always i want to call it infamous 2 infamous second son i'm gonna play that for a little bit and then uh, i'm gonna just ramble on and not ever stop this podcast no all right bye everyone